Pratt. This is the second quarter, the second semester of Law and Grace, which last semester we highlighted this thing of law and lamb, but this go round we're going to highlight beasts and lambs. And this is um, based on really my approach from last quarter. Um, and I'm going to read you a couple of paragraphs that I began with last quarter to bring you into remembrance all things that I have ever spoken. We always characterize the law as a book, the Old Testament, or as um, a certain covenant relations or as a set of rules. But I would like us to see it in relation to how certain people act, the basis of their judgments, the common threads that hold them together, <clears throat> beasts or lambs, the common thread that holds them together as one entity. This includes having a certain mindset. In the same manner, I would like us to see what we contrast with law to not be grace or new covenant or some other designation, but to see it in relationship to how certain people act, the basis of their judgments and mindsets, and the common threads that hold them all together as one entity. Uh, so we might call this class and the emphasis of it, this go around, beasts and lambs. Because <clears throat> now we want to really, really, um, we really want to see what's moving people. See, we, you know, we can talk all day long about the new covenant or the old covenant or this and that. And, and a lot of people are unaware that much of what's written in the New Testament by Paul and by others is actually a contrast of, we'll put it this way in the theological terms of law and grace, is really a contrast of the new covenant in, in contrast to, to the law. And it's, it's in there more than most people even realize um, because the law is such a big issue with the Jews at that time. And the law is a big issue with us because um, there are certain things that the law, um, <clears throat> I can't say births because what really birthed it was, was eating of the law, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which the law basically is, good and evil. Do good, don't do evil. It's, it really is that. And, um, but, and I really don't want to get off on this too much, but um, uh, that, that contrast of, of the knowledge of good and evil um, works really well with Pharisees or with people who judge. And the law is a, a, a judgment, a basis. It's really a basis of judgment whereby what um, is perceived as good and what is perceived as bad <clears throat> is um, not only adhered to, but violently <clears throat> um, enforced, such as the cross and taking Jesus, you know what I mean, and, and crucifying him because well, the law says this, and you're, you do this, or your disciples do this, or whatever. And, and in that whole scenario of the trial, and of the reaction, and of the death, and of the, the punishment before the death, all of that relates to the law. And in nature, it relates to beasts, or, I'm going to say this, or goats, their followers, who may not be beasts, but they will, because of their particular nature also, they will um, 
they will adhere to, but they will, they will uh, allow or give their credence to that, um, such as Paul standing there and letting them stone Stephen. Man of God, that sort of thing. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, I mean, Jesus, when he walked, the, the biggest problem he had wasn't with sinners, it was with religion, with religious people. And uh, the biggest problem God had with Israel was they were religious people, and in their, in their view of what God meant, they um, opened themselves more fully to the, to the beast within, ultimately, ultimately. And you, let's just even say, if it's a goat, the, a beast that's a follower of the greater beasts. Um, <clears throat> and, and you see the same thing with Jesus on the opposite end of that beast and lambs. You see that because he's the lamb of God. And, and you see that those who adhere to him adhere to a nature just like they do, the beasts do. They adhere to a nature. They give themselves to their nature. The law and the way that they interpret the law gives right and, and the privilege to be beastly as God understands beasts, as God understands beasts. Um, uh, you know, not to focus in on one particular group or anything, but <clears throat> but since I've got this right here. Uh, the Catholics, for example, you can go through the saints. You just go right through them. Joan of Arc and, and St. Patrick and all the way through, you go through the saints and at, at every juncture that, where those saints died, the Catholic Church killed them. Put them to death. And, and martyred them and said they were heretics and this is this is way more than that those there's so many there's so many um, and that's no different than what Jesus said you know you 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 slay the prophets and you do all this kind of stuff you know it's the same spirit and so we're not blaming one denomination or one religion or whatever <clears throat> um, but they later come back and they make saints out of them. And nobody remembers that you killed them, you know, and you didn't believe them. But when everybody starts going, oh, they were, you know, then they go, well, I guess we better make a saint out of them so that we'll look better. Folks, all those attitudes are beasts. All of those attitudes are beasts uh, which include everything from putting to death to covering up to to lying to changing history to make them look better to da 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 on and on and on and again I'm not just talking about the Catholic Church I'm talking in in general about beasts and about I'm talking about us you know when when I was growing up you you, you didn't have the potential to change history personally <laughs> you know you could. I mean, you, you could be aware by watching the history books that history was being rewritten. Some, many of you know what I'm talking about, that history was being rewritten before our very eyes and they were changing things from what really happened and what was known at that time. Um, what's the old saying? The person who lives longest gets to write the history because their view is it. Okay, so they they, <clears throat> they changed history, and part of that history was that they removed um, a lot of Christianity and, and things that were really of God from the books. Okay. Major things, things that were very important to the story. <clears throat> um, well, you had people who, who wrote history books that had that privilege, or people that were senators or over them that they could come in and they could tell them, this is, take this out and da 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 But nowadays, we can, we can pretty much, depending on how things go, we can write our own history. We can, we can get on Facebook and Twitter and everything else and, 
you can just start saying this is what I'm doing when you're not <laughs> you know Twitter well I prayed for three hours today you know or what whatever I'm just trying to show you that we can rewrite our own history and make us look better than than what we are and uh, um, Deb and I were talking about somebody yesterday and and she said well why don't they get on Facebook and tell everybody the need and everything and I noticed they haven't done that and they should have everybody praying and I said well you don't do that on Facebook you don't understand Facebook then which she's not on it I am not um, Facebook is to make yourself look good better than what you are it is and that's what people use it for and that's why you don't hear a whole lot of stuff that could make you look bad that you need prayer over. It, you might ask for prayer over something that can make you look good because you're spiritual and you're asking for prayer, but you're not primarily putting yourself out there as you really are and going, pray for me for God's sake, you know what I mean? Nah, -uh, not on Facebook, no. <clears throat> All right, and I'm sure there's some people who, who do, you know, out of what is it now a billion people on Facebook it is it's close it's a billion I think they said they reached that mark a billion people around the world is on Facebook um, I'm sure that there's seven or eight who don't do it that way <laughs> <coughs> <laughs> there, there, there could be up to ten you know what I mean but I don't know um, Anyway, my point is that we are also beasts, and we function as beasts, and here's the deal. We know that's true in the world, but sadly, it's really true in Christianity also, that we cover up, we do this, we do that, we, everything is, you know, it is meant to make us look better, um, and those attributes and and you can you can see them in yourself i can see them in myself i can i can tell when something's a beast and something's a lamb now you might go i can tell when something's me and something's jesus but you're being very kind about your your the assessment of of the person that's doing that it's you the beast you know i mean it really is and we all you know we all know what that's like. So, but I think um, that law and grace is really, this is just my opinion, I'm one man and I don't, I don't even count. So don't even listen to me when I say this. But I think the subject of law and grace is so just far from what ought to be examined in relationship to making any difference in your life. Well, look, the old covenant is this, and they did this and this and this. Doesn't affect you at all. The new covenant is this, and Jesus did this and this and this, and now we're saved, and we don't have to go to hell, and we don't have to be punished, and da 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 da. The new covenant is much more. Jesus said, "This is the, the here's my body. <laughs> this bread is my body. This represents the new covenant. This is my blood poured out. That's the new covenant." We go, no, the new covenant is, you know, and it just goes, eat it, drink it, put it in you. You know? And so that's the angle I'm coming from. That's the angle I'm coming from. So maybe, maybe that helps because I wasn't planning on going off in, in all of that. Um, just a few uh, things about the, the book I plan on going to a lot. Uh, if you will, turn with me to the book of Revelation, which is full of beasts and lambs. Amen? Full of it. And in fact, really what is the final struggle, not struggle, not, not the battle of Armageddon, the final struggles all the way through, what is it? It's a battle of beasts and lambs. But it, you have to understand the word battle to understand the way a beast battles and the way a lamb battles. You have to understand the difference, all right? So in uh, Revelation 1.1, 1, 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. 
and he sent and signified it by uh, his angel unto his servant John. All right, so, <laughs> so John is the writer of the book, and you find that in, um, in verse 4 and verse 9 and also at the end in chapter 22. And <clears throat> he's writing primarily because two main events. The book of Revelation was written by John because two main events. First of all, Jesus appeared to him and when he appeared to him, he gave him seven letters that were for the seven churches. All right. Now, <coughs> um, <clears throat> it is important to see a difference that happens in the book of Revelation right off. Two things happen. Jesus appears in bodily form <clears throat> to John, and he gives him letters for the churches, which if you think about the letters, they're not, they're not <clears throat> really revealing Christ. And yet this is the book of the revelation or the unveiling of Christ. They are primarily dealing with problems or, or beasts, trying to bring what was born again back into being lambs, okay? Through letters. The second thing that happened was John is called, a, a door is open in heaven and John is called come up here and began to see what's up here, not the way you guys are living for God down there. And he's caught up to a whole nother view of heaven and earth or of beasts and lambs. He's caught up to a whole nother level so that now he's going to see things from a completely different perspective and it's, and it's transforming and not only that, it's going to reveal Christ over and over and over. Christ as the Lamb of God. All right. So... Most people would say, oh, I just, you know, I'm going through it tonight. I wish Jesus would, would appear at the foot of my bed and just hand me a love letter. <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, these weren't love letters. <laughs> um, they... They weren't, and uh, uh, from John's perspective, you don't, you don't really, really see that transforming things and viewpoints are changing until he's taken out of the earth, no matter how much Jesus moves down there. Can I get amen on that? No matter how much, because there is reality of him that John didn't know and it and it certainly wasn't even coming across in the letters he didn't say I'm the Lamb of God I didn't he not at that point he's just dealing with churches he's not you know and dealing with churches for Jesus as I said before to have to write letters you know we should be able folks and this is why it starts releasing to in these letters, he that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. Okay, or we can read letters. We'll, we'll talk about that in just a little bit. Um, uh, <clears throat> so I'm just going to read this part. The first is the appearance of the Lord to him, which includes him giving letters to John for the churches. In other words, there's no message without first seeing the Lord. The second part are the events, visions, and realities that transpire once John has entered a door in heaven that leads to seeing things on a higher plane. All right. <clears throat> and all of that has to do with the letters, which, by the way, the New Testament is pretty much letters written to us. The letters are screaming certain things over and over in each one of them. Let them hear what the Spirit is saying to you. 
Uh, he that overcomes. And these are eternal lamb things that you can't be a lamb without. You can't. You, and you won't. You cannot. You cannot. <clears throat> so the book is not told as a story that unfolds before us from start to finish, which a lot of people think the book of Revelation is. Oh, this is, the, this is an end time book, and this is going to be the progression of what happens. Um, I don't, I'm sure I put it in here somewhere, but um, there, there are pictures, they are imagery, pictures from the heart of the Lord in relationship to are we a beast or are we a lamb, regardless of how good we, we think we appear. And again, when Jesus, when the lamb is on that throne and a goats come in and sheep come in and at that moment they're all mixed because Jesus, it says that the Lord will divide them. I don't, I think a bunch of them think that I'm okay. You know, I'm not a beast, I'm only a goat. <laughs> I, yes, I follow beasts, but I'm not a beast, see. And if you know anything about the book of Revelation, he that receives the mark of the beast, or he that receives the mind of the beast, and he that moves his hand like the beast, is counted as the beast. Okay. Jesus said, they said, we're, we're not whatever, we're not this or that, we're of God, we're Israel, and, and we have Moses and all this stuff, and, and Jesus He's worse. See, he's worse than me. Jesus says, you're of your father, the devil. You're, you're of. I didn't say you're the devil. I didn't say you're the, you know, I didn't say you're the father of the devil. I said, you're of your father, the devil. You're of him. And the things that he does, you're going to do. But they're coming from him. And this you, you'll see in the book of Revelation in relationship to beasts that everything flows down, including among beasts. Including among beasts, it, it flows down there. It's one nature, it's one flow. All right, so, um, rather it is communicating truth in forms using different imagery. Also in Revelation 2.14, as in Hebrews, uh, so here, God treats them not in the present, but as if they are the fulfillment of the past. It refers to Balak and Balaam as found in Numbers 22 and 23. So you find a lot of that. You find all kind of um, um, references to the Old Testament. And you see that in the book of Hebrews. Now, I don't know if that's ever affected you. Um, and, we'll, and, and right after, Right after I finish talking about this, we're going to be talking about effect. We're going to be talking about seeing, seeing. Because the lamb is full of eyes. And we'll talk about some of the different seeing that takes place. But there's a seeing that's supposed to make an impression on us. So just keep that in mind. So what we're saying here, and one of the things that should make an impression on us is like in Hebrews, he doesn't go, that book is not written and saying, you guys did this and that. Well, the time that, I mean, this, see, this is, this is like the judgment. We think the judgment is going to be everything we did. But he says, you're just like Israel. You wander, you're wandering in the wilderness. You're committing the same things that you did, da, 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 but he's, he's talking to them like they are Israel in the wilderness. He doesn't just say you're like that. He talks to them as if you are a continuation or the exact thing in his mind. So he talks about, well, you Balaam and Balak and Jezebel, and, and he just goes through all of this stuff in those letters. And you would think, now tell me if you wouldn't think that, you would think if he's writing to the letters in their present day, he would just say, you know, your church is really messed up. Here's exactly what you do every time. And then the next church, you, and you're, you're, you're messed up. You, this is exactly what you do. But in a very real way, he's pointing out that they're doing 
you know, it's Jezebel and it's this and that. And it's all these Old Testament stories that he's weaving them into. Uh, so, um, what does that mean? I can tell you that it means more than what I see, but I can tell you that I know from, from my searching and my desire to hear what the Spirit is trying to say to me over that, <clears throat> that God doesn't see us the way we think he does. Not completely. He doesn't see us only living my life and I did this here and I did that. He says that is this beastly thing right there. You can call it Jezebel, you can call it Balaam and Balak and all that. You can call, you know, you can call it whatever you want to, but it comes back to beasts and lambs, one way or the other. And he says, and the proof of it is that you're doing the same thing that they did. <coughs> all right, so the need for seeing, <coughs> because the, the, in, the, in the seven churches, they're not really seeing, um, they're reading letters. They're not really seeing. They're reading letters, okay? And <clears throat> so let me just read this to show you what I'm talking about. The word revelation also is, word revelation is also translated as apocalypse. The word revelation. Okay, somebody tell me what we understand the word revelation as the actual translation, what it means. Anybody know? Unveiling. Unveiling. Which goes back to the Holy of Holies. Amen? <clears throat> they didn't see. God. They heard his word, they put it into practice, and their practice was either their God or the way that they served and knew him. But they didn't see him behind the veil. Okay. The word apocalypse is another translation. I think, Mallory, is it the Greek translation? Yeah, apocalypsis is the Greek translation of the word revelation or unveiling. Well, say the word apocalypse to anybody, and they go, ah, ah, no, you know. I mean, we could say next Sunday, the apocalypse is going to begin in this church, and people go, I ain't coming, <laughs> you know. You go, oh, you don't want Jesus unveiled? You don't want to see him? You don't want to go into the Holy of Holies? But, it, folks, to enter the Holy of Holies by anybody apart from Jesus is death and destruction. Only in Jesus and one with him are we able to do that or covered in him as the high priest did and put on all these garments that represented him and, and, the, and the fragrance of Christ all over him so that you're in a cloud and you know, it's like, I can't even see your flesh, thank God, because I'll kill you. <laughs> You know? And that's, it's an apocalypse, and that's where we miss it. You know, we, we're, deeper, we're deeper life people, and we talk about the revelation of Christ, and I want to come to a revelation of Christ. You want to come to apocalypse? Do you? Amen, you better, because that apocalypse is to see him, and no man had seen God and lived. You're dead. However, it goes beyond that, but he who is your life appears, then you appear, okay? And you appear in glory, not in you, in yourself. You appear in oneness with him. <clears throat> um, so, uh, what we call the book of Revelation is really just a letter. Oh, but let me qualify it. It's a letter that reveals something. Ah, but let me qualify it. To John, it was not merely a letter, but a seeing. Yes. To John, right? It was a seeing. 
It was an entering into, it was a, an opening. And to us, it's just a letter. It's just a book. It's a letter. See? And we examine the letter to try to see instead of asking God to unveil the, the book of the Revelation of God, unveil the one that that represents. Because am I right or wrong on this? Most people who read the, the book of Revelation don't see Jesus throughout it. <clears throat> they think it's an end time book. And so they never come to the revelation of Christ. And by the way, it's not called the book of Revelations. It's the book of Revelation. The, and it's not even the book of Revelation. It is, as his words, the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's the first four words there, uh, five words there. And so it is, <clears throat> it is this seeing that John has, has come to and that he's trying to communicate, but he's got to write it down to pass it along because he's not going to be around. So what does that mean? So we'll never get it. No. It means that we must cry out for a seeing and not just a reading. <clears throat> All right. Uh, but once that seeing was put down on paper and added to a book, the Bible, it became a letter. In other words, theirs and our seeing may be different than that of John. We may miss much that is there in the book of Revelation. You know, we may miss much. I mean, if this is the final book of the whole Bible, not just of the Old Testament or the New Testament, the final book of the whole Bible, you'd think it'd have more to say than there's gonna be a big battle and, you know, or there's gonna be a rapture and, you know, main thing is we get out of there. You know, that's the, that's the concept. We'll deal with that, <clears throat> especially in, in light of this seeing. All right, so I want to uh, keep your place here in uh, Revelation, but turn to John, Gospel of John, uh, chapter 1. And I want to show you four examples of seeing within just a few verses. Does that sound good? Four examples of seeing within just a few verses. And they're all different Greek words. So they're all different kinds of seeing, all right? So we're going to start with the, <clears throat> the best uh, on down. Chapter 1. Did I say chapter 1? Okay. Um, <clears throat> verse 35 is the first thing. Again, the next day, John stood, uh, uh, what did I say, 35? Do I have the wrong verse for that? I know where it's at. It's 29 the next day. Yeah. Huh. Verse 29. Sorry. <clears throat> the next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. The, world, the word behold is a Greek word for seeing. Behold what? Behold the Lamb of God. And it's a particular seeing. It's not just any seeing. See, in English, we, we say, well, you got to see this. And we go, okay. And basically, that sort of just means that we have to look at it and then, you know, whatever. Whatever. <clears throat> this word, it is a seeing with the emphasis upon the impression. The impression it is to have on the observer when seeing its inner reality. It's not really about the seeing as much as it is about the impression, but the impression comes with the kind of seeing that we have. With the when we see correctly, as is used in this Greek word, it has an impression on you. <clears throat> and um, uh, I wrote a bidding, it is a bidding to see deeply. Um, let this make an impression on you. 
In other words, behold, let this make an impression on you. And then I wrote, you are to carry this impression with you always to help you identify it again and again wherever you see it. That's pretty good. That's an impression. Isn't it true that if something really makes an impression on you, you really don't forget it? I mean, so much, you know, maybe, maybe in the long run or something like that. But anything that truly makes an impression on you, um, it, it stays with you. Well, John used that particular word to say, you need to see the Lamb of God to such a degree that it makes an impression on you and stays with you long enough over and over so that every time you see that again, you recognize it because of the impression, the impression that it has made on you. Uh, verse uh, 36. And looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. Okay, and, and looking is the word we're, we're uh, talking about now. And it's also in verse uh, 42. And he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah thou shalt be called Cephas. And when he beheld him, it's the same word as verse 36, um, and looking upon Jesus as he walked. And then and Peter beheld, he beheld Peter. Thou art, you were, but now you are. Um, and it means to look searchingly or to gaze or to be fixated upon so as to discern and declare correctly, to look into the heart of someone might best express this meaning. And so to now it is moved from being impressed or, or, or more than impressed, because that's not really proper, to ha have the lamb, um, an impression of him that has been you know, it's like back then they used to have seals and they had wax and they'd get the wax soft and then they'd, they'd put it on the paper and they would seal it. To have an impression put upon you about him is one thing. But now um, to, what was it? to look into the heart of someone might best express this, to gaze or be fixated so as to discern correctly and to declare correctly. So that we now, the impression is moving from just an impression of him to discerning the heart of that. To discern the heart of that. And that's a movement from behold the Lamb of God to take it away the sin of the world. To behold the Lamb as he walked. Um, <clears throat> and then verse 38 then um, and, uh, verse 37 says, And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then uh, Jesus turned and saw them following. Okay? And he says, What seek ye? Okay? So, so he turns, and he looks at them, or he sees them. Um, and it, is, it means to fix your eyes upon with intent to determine what is before you. It involves holding your gaze, not merely noticing it as it passed by. So the disciples come up, and Jesus wants to know what he's got. He wants to know what he's dealing with. He's looking. See, he's looking. This is just, this is just one pair of those eyes that the lamb has. He's covered with eyes. And this is one look that he looks and uses for us when we first start coming around or when we come to the altar or when we come to him in prayer or when we, however you want to put it. And, and uh, he looks at us to discern. It means to fix your eyes upon with intent to determine what is before you or what is before him. It involves holding your gaze, not merely noticing as it passed by. You're not a tourist. You're trying to figure out, and Jesus said, his words proved that this was his look, what seek ye? He wants to know what's your motive. He doesn't just want you to, 
Uh, this is so difficult at times, and only the Holy Spirit can help us apply this personally. But he doesn't just want you to do things. Um, he wants your heart. And he's looking, you know, he's looking to, to discern you. To, he, he fixes his eyes upon. His eyes run to and fro looking for this. Trying to find that which is uh, truly set on him and not just going through the motions. Cruise control, da 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 you know. And then um, <clears throat> the final one is verse 39. And he saith unto them, come and see. This, and they said, uh, uh, where is it, the words before? What seek ye? They say unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted master, where dwellest thou? And he saith unto them, come and see. <clears throat> come and see. And they came and saw where he dwelt. This seeing is there is absolutely no regard to the object. It's as the light. The light shines and you're not looking at the light. You're looking at what the light is opening up to you. Okay, in other words, you could be looking at the event. You could be looking at the people, but you're not discerning, you're not discerning him. We want to see where you dwell. We're not wanting to see you. And they came and they looked. So, for example, turn on a light and ask, can you see now? You turn on a light and you say, can you see now? Well, you're not seeing the light. You're just seeing the objects in the room. You're not discerning Jesus as the light. You only see the circumstances, the objects and events that he enlightens. And we call that seeing. All right. Now, what are the chances, having gone through these, that you're going to remember any of this? No, I mean, let's just be honest. What are the chances you'll remember any of this? What are the chances it hasn't made an impression on you at all? What are the chances that this is the word of God, used of God, has specific things that can reach us, but we just took it as a, um, a Greek lesson, a lesson in the Greek. Okay, I understand that because if I, if, that was, if I was out there and that was happening, I might take that uh, angle. But, but I would cheat myself if I did that. I would cheat myself on this front. Lord, I, am, I bet you I'm not going to remember all of that. But I tell you what, there are different, I've got this. There are different ways of seeing, and I need the Holy Spirit to start making me see more than just one way. And assuming that when the Bible says see, that it just means that. And I don't even have to know the Greek. I can say, Lord, what do you mean by see this? You see what I mean? Okay, so what's, what's the point of sharing it then? Well, number one, to say that, what I did. And number two, to, to open us to the, the cry that's over and over to the churches, not to the bride, to hear what the Spirit is saying so that we can, in a situation like this or any other situation, not be dull, but we say, uh, I, I, don't, I don't have a clue, I don't get it, I won't remember this, but I want to hear or I, or I want to see, I want to hear what the Spirit is trying to say to me, okay? And, Uh, my prayer tonight uh, for this class and f for you, for you, was different than any other prayers I've prayed and may become a standard for. My prayer was, Father, allow, uh, move in such a way that the Holy Spirit 
because I was thinking about this here with the Spirit, that the Holy Spirit might take joy that we are hearing what he's trying to say to us. Completely different from, oh, Lord, bless people, or open our eyes, or da-da-da-da, or, or bless, you know, anoint me, or, you know, all that kind of crap that's all self-centered for the most part. But the Holy, and then I said, for the Holy Spirit, Father, shares constantly in churches all over the world. And we never pray that he would get the satisfaction that someone could hear what he's trying to say, and he could just go, you know, totally apart from anybody else, you know. And I think, I do think that was a right prayer for his sake, because it's always about our sake, for you or for me or da 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 da. Anyway, um, all right, let's, let's talk about the rapture. The term's not used in the Bible, but basically the, the, the concept and information about what the rapture is is that, um, that we're going along and then just before the great, the great tribulation happens, um, when everything goes bad in the book of Revelation, you know, all the bad stuff happens, that God mercifully pulls us out of all of that and then we only come back with Jesus at the Battle of Armageddon where we were useless. We, we do nothing. I, I think one angel goes over, takes the great red dragon, takes, that's all it says, takes him and puts him in. That's it. That's, well, I mean, that's, what it, that's the way it describes it. Now, now, you know, we'll get in because there is more than that. But I'm just trying to show you that our view of, you know, the, uh, the apocalypse and, and the Battle of Armageddon, there's, there's more to be seen. Amen. A seeing. There's more to be seen. And we want to see what the Lord has for us, what the Spirit wants to say to us. And that's the main thing. Okay, so I'll just read this. The rapture, not about escaping but overcoming. Much, uh, much of most people's interest in the book of Revelation has to do with end time events and with what is termed as the rapture. The basic premise of the rapture would be to remove you from all the negative things that happen in the book of Revelation. The approach we take on this book may show that escaping tribulation is the exact opposite of what the book is about. Um, in Revelation chapter one through three, the one common denominator of each church is the word overcome. And we, we want to really see that. I'm not sure if right now I deal with it. Um, but I will say this, to overcome, and it even says that you may overcome as I overcame. There's in the book of Revelation. And he overcame through the cross. Uh, and it does tell us how we overcome by the blood of the lamb, someone who was defeated. I mean, if you look at it as a battle, someone who was defeated. By the word of our testimony, which is another word, testimony, that's huge, and it's perfectly placed throughout the book of Revelation so that we can see what the testimony is that we're supposed to have. It's incredible. Um, and because we love not our lives unto the death. And it's that those verses will become even more powerful as we look at the context. Um, where was it? <clears throat> the most common, the one common denominator of each church that he's saying to is to overcome. Isn't that interesting? By what? The blood of their leader who died called Lamb the word of their testimony, which is the word of martyrdom, it's the same word as witness, and you should be witnesses, you should be martyrs. Testimony, it's the same word. The word of our martyrdom and the fact that they love not their life even unto death. The test of the book is equal to many examples of Christians losing 
even unto death in the book of Revelation. At this early stage of our study, we must look upon the Lamb. We must look the way it says to look upon him so as to discern his being. We must look upon the Lamb to such a degree so as to make a, a deep impression and that we would be changed by that nature. We do this that we might catch every example of Jesus' Lamb spirit throughout the book of Revelation. Uh, here I go on this, but I've already shared some on it. What goes along with that is that we must hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Do we want to hear him as to what he desires to communicate to us? Or do we merely want to get something out of the teaching to add to our repertoire or our arsenal? However we look at that. The Spirit has something to say in the book of Revelation. From the beginning, his angle is from that of persecution along with having a lamb attitude in the midst of it. So let's go back to Revelation chapter 1. <clears throat> we'll see that because I did make the statement from the very beginning so it ought to be in the first chapter. Okay, uh, this is uh, Revelation 1, 9. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom uh, and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. So, uh, now, this doesn't mean he was on a vacation on an island somewhere in the Mediterranean. <laughs> Uh, he was in exile. He was basically imprisoned on that island. And he is writing to show certain things, and that is that he is their companion in tribulation. He's not showing the victory. And he's not declaring, don't worry, we'll all get it soon. I'm your companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and, uh, and patience of Jesus Christ. And the kingdom relates to government and how lamb governs. And patience relates to the faith and patience of the saints. And if you don't know that phrase, you need to know what is the faith and patience of the saints. Because when the beast is at his worst, and we're not talking about end time events, when the beast is at his worst, you, it'll, it'll tell you this is the way, this is how you're going to understand right here and how you'll get through this. Was in the isle that is called Patmos, meaning I was, I was in prison for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. And there it is, that word, testimony. I was here to give testimony of Lamb. That's why I'm on this island. That's why I'm in prison. I am, I'm not looking for deliverance. I am here to give or to be a testimony of the Lamb and the way he lives in us and the way he is in us, including patience and what have you. All right. <clears throat> so he continues with this. He continues with this theme and does not hold back from showing that the Spirit's main emphasis is not deliverance and victory, but holds up having a certain kind of spirit in the midst of suffering, even unto death. So let's look in chapter 2 and verse 13. <clears throat> this, <laughs> well, I'm going to read it right here. <clears throat> I know thy works, this is the Lord talking, I know thy works where thou dwellest, even where Satan's throne is. All right. Uh, you, think, you think imprisonment on Patmos is bad? You know, I know some wives are thinking, I already dwell there. <laughs> I know thy works where thou dwellest, even where Satan's throne is, and that thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith, even in those days in which Antipas 
was my faithful martyr who was slain among you where Satan dwells. It already said that. Why is it reiterating where he was slain where Satan dwells? What's up with that? Every ounce of that isn't talking about victory or anything. He is lifting up somebody who was in the midst where Satan was. Now, we think we got it bad. Anybody here think you got it bad? <laughs> you think you got it bad, you know? And, and don't, don't jokingly or even half seriously say, oh, well, what I'm going through is almost where Satan dwells, or God will give you that. Yeah. The goal isn't to get you out of this stuff. The goal is for you to be a testimony, and you're going to find out that every time the testimony of God is given, somebody dies. It's a martyr. It means martyr. I'm here for the testimony of God. That's what he said. And it's, and it's powerful throughout the book of Revelation. You'll see it over and over and over and over again. Um, he already made it plain that such a direction was to be expected for those who follow the Lamb. So in verse 10, and we're about to take a break here, but in verse 10 of, of Revelation 2, fear none of those things. Now, now this is this what we're reading in verse 10. We read in verse 13 was a part of a letter to a different church. Now, and verse 10 is to Smyrna. The other one was to Pergamum. Uh, verse 10, fear none of those things with which thou shalt suffer. Okay, my God, we fear it all. We're continually fighting and fearing and wanting deliverance and victory. We're, you know, if, we, if the book of Revelation was an actual thing that was going to happen, we'd all fail. Because <laughs> we can't even, you know, Jesus said, if you can't do it in a green tree, you know, it, then you are not going to make it when when that's really hard. Um, fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison. What? Yeah, don't fear it. He says, don't fear because I'll deliver you. That's not what he says. He says, don't fear being thrown in there because you're there for a reason. This is all happening for a reason. You're either a lamb or a beast. You're either, your, your government, the, the beast will sit on the throne as, acting as God. Anybody remember that in Thessalonians? You're either governed by one or the other. You're either fighting and clawing and trying to, trying to, to, to you know, ward off. You know, if, if you're, to me, if God was really true, he would say, I know that you dwell where where Satan dwells, and I'm suggesting you move. <laughs> you know, get a van, <laughs> and go live down by the river. Anyway, so that's, but that's not what he's saying. And that's not the spirit in which he's doing this. So verse 10 again. Fear none of these things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried, and you shall have tribulation, Forget the 10 days right now. You shall have tribulation. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you life. Amen, anybody? Well, you know, this whole book, it only gets worse from this point. <laughs> it does. It doesn't get more fun. It confronts the beasts in us and says, where's the lamb? And we say, well, that's not fair. The beast says that. The lamb says it doesn't matter if it's fair or not. He dies on a cross. That's what he does. Is it fair? No. Was anybody, anybody correct or had right motives when he died for them? Yet for a good man, some would dare to die. There weren't any. None. They were all corrupt. And he didn't go, well, if you... If some of you will get nice, <laughs> well, you know, I mean, we, you know, just, just give me a few. I mean, even his disciples are running and hiding at that point. 
And, and to prove it, I mean, you say, well, John was there. John is sitting there weeping, going, this is horrible. This is the worst thing to ever happen. It was the best thing that ever happened. It was the most glorious thing. It was the greatest victory. The death was the greatest victory. And like us, with that beastly way, we're looking and going, this is, this is tragedy. And this just shows you how bad those beasts are. That's the beast talking in you. Yes. Yes. i got to finish this. Just one sentence. Be faithful, and, uh, be faithful unto death. He's not furnishing them with ways of escape because there's something greater that God is after. All right, let's take a break.